Hello everyone, my name is Liliana and I will be talking about personalized medicine. Personalized medicine is when it's a, therape a therapeutic approach where you develop a drug or a treatment that is specific for that one person. And I'm going to talk about personalized uh, medicine using the example of the first case of a personalized treatment. And this was done on Little Miller um, in 2018, so quite recently. So uh, Little Miller, she was born a perfect uh, healthy baby. Uh, she was very active, jumping around on her furniture back and forth. But however, by the time that she was three years old, her right foot started turning inwards. At four, her parents noticed that she was not seeing very well. Then at five, she started having this tumbling uh, movements with her legs and she started keep on falling. At six years old, she was practically blind. She could not uh, speak so well anymore and she could not control her movements and she was having trouble swallowing. Her parents got worried, obviously, and they went to many doctors trying to find what could be wrong with little Mila. First, they did some brain scans. And on the scans, they found out that Mila's brain is slightly smaller than what would be expected for a girl of her age. They also uh, measure the uh, brain activity, and they found out that little Mila was suffering from many seizures day and night. And these seizures were getting worse as she got older, and by the time that she was six years old, she was having uh, 30 seizures a day. Traditional blood tests revealed nothing that could indicate what is wrong with little Mila. Parents were getting desperate. Finally, there was one doctor that he thought he knew what was wrong with Mila. So he took a little piece uh, of the skin of Mila, put it under a very powerful microscope and looked at it, and he found out that Mila cells had these dense structures inside of them, and these structures are not normal in our cells, but they are characteristic of a certain uh, rare disease. And in 2016, Mila was finally diagnosed with Batten's disease. Patton's disease, I think the best way to describe Patton's is to use uh, the words of Mila's mother, where she says that Patton's disease is a combination of Parkinson's, uh, dementia, epilepsy, plus blindness. So it's quite a drastic disease. More on Patton's. It's a rare disease. Out of the 2.2 billion children that exist in the world, approximately 20,000 suffer from this disease. The fact that it's so rare might explain why it took so long for the doctors to diagnose Mila. It's a neurodegenerative disease, which means that it affects the brain and the eyes. It's genetic. It's a small mutation on a certain gene that makes the cell not able to produce an essential protein that is necessary for the cell to recycle old proteins and old fats. These old proteins and old, fa and old fats cannot be recycled, so they accumulate in the cell, they form those dense structures that you saw, and the cell will end up dying because it's full of, of waste. Moreover, there are about 14 mutations that we know cause patterns. And the one that Mila has is called CLN7. Mila's type, you can see the first symptoms at three years old, and by the time that the child is 11 or 12, she will die. So it's quite a, fail to a fatal disease. But Mila's genetics are quite important, and they are the key for her treatment. So let's go a bit more into the genetic part. All of us have two copies of one gene. We inherit one copy from our father, and one copy from our mother. The two copies of a gene system is brilliant because if there's something wrong with one of the copies, you always have the other copy as a backup. So in Mila's case, she got from her father the common known Batten's disease mutation that is CLN7. She inherited from her father. The father has the second normal copy, so then he does not have the disease but Mila has the disease, which means that the other copy must have also a defect. But the doctors could not find what this defect was. It was not something that they had seen before. So they went and they scanned the entire genome of the entire family, trying to find where the mistake was. And they found out that Mila had inherited uh, the, a disease gene also from a mother, where the mother had a very random, rare mutation that they had never seen before. And this mutation causes splicing mistake 
that makes the gene not work. So in the end, she has both copies that are wrong, so she's suffering from the disease. Now, what is this splicing? Splicing is both the reason why she's sick, but is also the reason why she managed to get a, a therapy. When we usually speak about how genes make proteins, we usually go about something like this. We have a gene, the gene has DNA, DNA has the information that allows the cell to then produce an RNA where this information is stored in a way that the cell can understand and then produces the protein that it needs. This is true, but is not exactly accurate because this RNA production part is actually two pieces. When the DNA is transformed into RNA, it is comp the RNA is composed of exons and introns. Exons are the information that the cell needs to produce the protein. Introns are pieces of information that are not important for the sequence of the protein. So the cell can recognize what is an intron, what is an intron and what is an exon. She removes what is not necessary, the introns, puts the exons together to form the correct message that the cell needs to be able to read to produce the protein. This system of removing the not important parts and putting together the important ones is called splicing. So, as the name says, if you have a splicing mistake, then you are not able to do splicing. How does this look like in Miller? So you have the DNA where you have a small mutation. This mutation, when you move it into RNA, it's within the intron and the exons. This mistake here confuses the cell, and the cell can no longer distinguish what is an intron and what is an exon, what is important for the production of the protein and what is not. So when it tries to remove the introns, it cannot remove this one. So in the end, this message does not make sense, so it cannot produce the protein. Now, w uh, in the good fortune of Miele, in a way, we know how to fix splicing mistakes using a splicing therapy where we use very small pieces of DNA that are called antisense oligonucleotides. It's a horrible word for something very simple. It just attaches itself to the mistake and hides the mistake. So the cell can no longer see what, where the problem is and it can identify that this is an intron and this is an exon produces the right message, and then it can produce the protein. Sounds quite simple, right? So taking this approach of these antisense oligonucleotides, doctors and scientists collaborated to actually produce Miller's drug in one year. Please bear in mind that a normal drug, until it goes to clinical trials, can take at least 15 years. So one year is quite the achievement. How did they do this? In the lab, they started by producing several uh, different versions of this antisense oligonucleotide, this small piece of DNA, that could possibly work to fix the mistake, to hide the mistake. Then they tested them in Miller cells, and they, uh, out of all of them that they tried, they found the one that works best, and they'd call it Millesen, in all honor of Miller. Then, just because you can hide the mistake, does not mean that the protein is doing its job. So how did they check for this? They went again to Miele cells, and here you have the normal uh, cells of Miele that produce these dense black structures in the cells. When they treated it with a drug, these structures disappear. So this tells you that the, this, this Miele cell, this oligonucleotide, can uh, hide the mistake enough that the cell can produce a protein that can do its job, that is remove the waste from the cell. Also, they needed to test this drug in animals to, find the, uh, to prove that this drug was not toxic. So with all of these, they could go to a clinical trial organization and they finally got approval to start a clinical trial in 2018, January. Again, this drug is made specifically for Miele, so it's a clinical trial for Miele. So there's only one person in this clinical trial. So they started by giving small doses of this drug to Millet just to figure out if she's getting a bad reaction or if she's getting any side effects. To give this drug, 
you need to give it uh, within the, the spine. What you do is you inject the drug in the liquid, between the vertebrae of your spine, in the liquid that surrounds the spinal cord. This liquid that surrounds the spinal cord will then transport the drug in in through the brain and the spine, so through the nervous system of Mila. And there it can reach the cells and do its job. Now, the drug did not produce any uh, side effects that they could see, and it was not toxic for Mila. So uh, now that they know that it's good, now they only need to give a maintenance do dose every three months. So in this way, Mila cells always have enough of the drug to keep on working. Now the big question, did it work? Uh, the report about this treatment and about the clinical trial came out in October of this year. So it's fresh out of the press. And according to Mila's mom, uh, Mila does not slump, she can sit straight, and her arms and legs are not spastic, so they, she does not have muscle contractions. This means that this drug has improved uh, Mila's quality of life. I know that sitting straight does not sound like a big achievement, but uh, it does mean a lot for someone to be able to sit so that he can get a food, not to be strapped into a, sh a chair, for example. Also, another gigantic improvement on Mila is that her, the number of her seizures and the duration of these seizures decreased by 50%. So by the time that she started the treatment, she was six years old. She was having 30 seizures a day. She only had now, at the end of the treatment, 15 seizures a day. From almost two minutes per seizure, she was reduced to uh, only a few seconds. So this is huge. On the other hand, her communication skills, her social skills, and her motor skills did not improve that much. Also, the size of her brain continued to decrease. This is not so surprising, because this is a treatment, it's not a cure. It's there to help the cells that are already there. It cannot, if the cells have already died, it cannot create cells out of nowhere. So it's helping the cells that are there, but if she already lost them, then there's nothing we can do about this. Uh, what is the future of Mila? Well, it's hard to say. As I said, this report came in October, so after almost two years of treatment. So, and this is the first clinical trial. She is the only person that can receive this drug. So it's not like we have anything to compare it to. So we don't really know what's going to happen. Oh, the only thing we can do is wait for the doctors to continue to uh, uh, understand and follow up the development of Mila and see how she is responding to the drug and how she is developing in the future. There's no guarantees. So Mila's was the first person to receive a personalized drug treatment, so it's official now. Personalized medicine is a reality right now. What does Miller's story actually mean for the future of personalized medicine? So Miller's drug can only be used by her, so it's not like I can take this drug and give it to someone else. But the idea on how to build this drug, how to go through the clinical trial approval phase, and how to give the drug, all of this can be adapted to the next person. And there is about 1.3 million people that could benefit from a treatment like Miller. So this is a lot of people. Also, I do have to say that producing a drug in a year is quite the achievement, and it's not likely to happen again. The truth is that they made it in a year because there was a lot of scientists and doctors that just came together, dropped everything, gave their money and their time to produce this drug in a year, because Mila was in already a very severe state. But also, Mila was lucky because we already knew some things about splice therapies. We already had some ideas on how we could fix the issue. So there's about 30 years of research that are in that one year of production. And some other gene uh, diseases might not be that lucky. Also, medicine, personalized medicine, so medicine for one person, is also risky and costly. It's risky because you can only test this drug in an animal and in the person that will receive the drug. This drug is made for that one person. I cannot test it somewhere else. So I, it's impossible to predict if it's going to help, if it's going to be worse, what is the outcome. 
So uh, in the end, personalized medicine is a reality. Miller is a success story because independently of how far she has come and even if some of her treatment has not given the fantastic results that we were expecting, still her parents keep on saying that Batten's is really bad, but in, in her mother's opinion, Batten's, for her, it looks like Batten's has stopped. So she took the risk and it paid off. And it's up to every patient and to the family of the patient to decide if they also want to take the risk. And thank you. Lily, thank you for your splendid talk. Now we will have five minutes for your questions to Lily. So raise your hands if you're interested in anything you might want to ask her. Which hand is this done? Wait, you can wait for the microphone. Oh. Yeah, microphone's for everyone, nice. Um, which country was this done in? So it was done in the US. And they paid for that? Uh, so uh, Mila's mother, when she was diagnosed with the disease, she started a foundation. It's called Stop Buttons uh, Foundation. And with this foundation, she collected some money. Also, uh, so, we d so actually the cost of this was not made public, so we don't know how much it cost. But we do know that the mother was collecting money. We also know that many of the researchers gave the, some of their own grant money to do some of, the, of some of the research that was involved in here. So I cannot tell you how much it cost, but uh, it's not like you're going to get a big revenue like in Big Pharma, right? So. Any other inquisitive guests? The Mr. on the third row. Okay, thanks. So just to make sure I understood, this was yeah. the first case of personalized medicine in documented history, or yeah. were there some other cases? It's okay. the first. Uh, it's considered the first uh, case of personalized medicine because it's the only one that is documented. But there are already some. After this uh, trial, there are already at least three other three other trials that are rumored to be happening right now for other types of diseases. But we will know more when they come out in the future, which I don't know when. So, and this was also the first documented case of this type of disease with all these gene combinations or were there also befo before? So Batten's disease was known before. As I said, there are 14 types of Batten's and each of these 14 types is unique enough to require their own clinical trial. And there are some types that are slightly more common, so then these have been a bit more researched, and there are some types that have basically no research at all. On the other hand, the type of Miller's, where she has the known Batten's mutation from the father and this splicing mistake, this is completely unheard of. That they know, no one else has this. She's the one in a million. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We will have time for, for one last question. I think I saw one raised hand over there. Don't look around, it was you. <laughs> uh, don't be ashamed, go ahead. Don't be ashamed. Um, so if, we would have if they would have sequenced her, both the copies of her DNA when she was born, would they have known that this was there before as soon? And if yes, then would it make sense to sequence both copies of DNA for every child that is born just to see if there is a mistake? Lily, could you please repeat the yes. question? This is actually a great question because it's a big debate right now. So he asked me, so by the time that we gave the treatment to Mila, it was already too late because she had already lost a lot. She could already not, not speak so well and not move so well. What if she, they had found out the problem when she was born, then what would have been the outcome? So theoretically, if they had found out when she was born, when her cells were not, there were not that many dead cells, then uh, her outcome would have been a normal child, theoretically, right? If, if the treatment goes perfect, there's nothing wrong with it, we are giving the right dose at the right time, like, if you find out in the beginning, then uh, she will be a normal child. And then he asked me, so then should we just scan the entire genome of every child when they are born to then figure out if we can prevent some of these diseases? This is actually something that uh, Mila's mother is actually claiming, uh, or she's uh, suggesting that maybe we, now that genome sequencing, so sequencing our genome is cheap, 
why don't we just do it to find out uh, if a child has a severe condition that can be treated from the beginning before it's too late. Uh, the thing is that this is an ethical debate because if you're sequencing the entire genome, then you're also going to know every single thing that genomically can happen to that child. Is he prone to art conditions? Is he going to be tall? Is he going to be short? Um, so all of these things. And the question is, do you really want to know that far? Uh, is it really worth it from the 20,000 children that will be better to the other 2.2 million and the price that I it must admit, a great, a great question Sorry. and a great <laughs> answer too. Um, don't forget to look, um, to look for Lily in the break and don't be ashamed to ask her any further things you might want to ask. Yes. So thank you, Lily. Thank you for your splendid talk. Thank you.